Yo, what is up, my friends? Welcome to another episode of Those Cast. My name is Benamar Kasan. If you're new to our YouTube channel, please subscribe because we release new episodes every Tuesday and Friday at 12 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Today's guest is arguably the biggest police officer I've ever had on this podcast. It's the first one, Mr. Neeraj Kumar, who is from, who belonged to the 1976 batch. And AGMUT Arunachal Goa Mizoram and Union Territories cadre. Recently, the chief advisor to the BCCI for the anti-corruption squad. Uske saat saat he helped nab several associates of Daud Ibrahim. He was responsible for exposing several state lottery cases. He was the police commissioner in Delhi when the Nirbhaya case happened, and he brought the killers to justice. He's also done a bunch of incredible things in the Delhi Traffic Police. He's served in the CBI as well. This is this podcast is an entire police career in the making. He was oh I also forgot he was also the director general of Tihar of Delhi prisons particularly Tihar jail. This is the level of breadth we're dealing with in today's conversation. If you know about the twenty thirteen Rajasthan Royals match fixing and betting case, he was the man who uncovered it and he delivered several players to justice. The range of this man's career is astounding and so is his honesty. And Mr. Neeraj Kumar is as transparent as you would want an honest public servant to be. This episode with retired IPS Neeraj Kumar begins in three, two, one. I was just going through your bio. Usually, people have a coherent career in one or two domains. I mean, everything from terrorism to the hard jail to BCCI. It's just endless. Before I even start, you know, I I always wanted to know what it is like to be in the inside of a jail, right? With all of these prisoners, I'm sure there's a distinction between like um, what the police thinks and what the prisoners think. And just a very rudimentary question to start with: What was it like being prison director? Like, did any crazy insights stuck out to you that? maybe people like myself civilians would not know about the inside of a prison the first thing i want to tell you vinamur is that uh, the people who look after the prisons or who run the prisons are not policemen the only person from the police who is there is the director general of police no who is the director general of prisons actually the rest of the staff are all civilians that means the dig the you know deputy superintendents and all they belong to a separate uh, cadre of prison administrators they do not belong to the police although they wear the khaki uniform so a common person feels that they are policemen who are guarding uh, the prisoners in a jail but that's not true this is the first uh, misconception that i must uh, you know uh, set uh, right and civilians are allowed to also pacify disobeying prisoners no no it is the prison staff who de- handle them when somebody is going unruly it is they who will deal with it the people who deal with them uh, are not policemen technically under the law even the director general of prison should not be a police officer why because it is a totally separate uh, wing of the criminal justice system you have the police you have the judiciary in between is the prosecution and last is the correctional services which are the prisons so they are all in separate cadres so we are going strictly by the letter of the law Uh, there should be no police officer in the prison department it's a totally independent uh, you know hierarchy altogether which looks after the reformation of the prisoners so they're all correctional officers yes and they have never been to through the same training that someone like you has been no not at all how do you become a correctional officer no the 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 job ads come out uh, and people apply if they succeed they get special training after which they join the prison but the khaki is deceiving ah huh? it will really make yes. you look like it's a bunch it, of it's unfortunate people think that uh, the same police officer arrest them and his brethren look after the prisoners in the jail yeah. that's not true 
So, so then what is the difference between say a Tihar jail, which is like a central jail in Delhi, and the kind of lockup that you have in a police station? No, lockup in a police station is a police setup. Yeah. That is not a prison. You know, that is only for the period that the man is in police custody. You must have read in the papers that the police apply for what is called police remand. Yeah. No, you get a quite police. a dangerous word. Well, yeah. It shivers you, you know. Uh-huh. So, when somebody is arrested, as per law, he is to be produced before the court within 24 hours, right? If the police needs that person for any longer period of time, they apply to the court and say that we need this person uh, for a further period of so many days because we have to complete the investigation. Mm-hmm. And the court decides whether the police should have their custody or not. And it can say two days police remand, three days police remand. But the maximum remand that a police uh, officer normally can get is 15 days. You have to complete the investigation within 15 days. Under certain laws, like the anti-terror laws, the police remand can be longer. After which, the person is either released on bail or sent to judicial custody. Hmm. Right? If the court feels that the police is uh, you know, undertaking some important investigation, and for that person to be at large, uh, is uh, detrimental to society, detrimental to the in- investigation being carried out by the police, then the man is kept under judicial custody mm. and then he goes to the jail. Now, the jail again is, is this is very interesting and in which your viewers may like to uh, understand. The jail is also divided into two parts. One is under trial prisoners and the other is sentence prisoners, that means convicts. So if you are under trial, that means either you have been sent on judicial custody or the investigation is still continuing and you are kept inside, then that is under trial prisoners. Once you are convicted, that means the trial is over and you are sentenced to say three years imprisonment or seven years imprisonment, then you go to what is called the convict jail. So certain jails in Tihar are meant exclusively for convicts and certain others are meant for under trials. So Jin Lohak is sentenced, so then they're there serving their sentences or awaiting further sentencing. Does that how it work? No, th- those who are under trial we are awaiting the finalization of the trial. And that could take anywhere from two years, three years, months? Yeah, yeah. It, it can take very long. Um, you know, usually after certain, uh, a few months, they are released on bail. And then the trial can go on and on, you know, mm-hmm. indefinitely. So, Neeraji, as, you know, as the Director General of Prisons, what was your role? Were you overseeing personnel the correction staff, were you making sure that certain drills were being followed? Were you ensuring that um, there was a general sense of order in the prison? Because I've never met someone with that job description. Everything. You not only have to look after your own staff, their welfare, their training, their deployment, so on and so forth. Uh, You also have to look after the security of the prisoners that they are kept kept, uh, safely, they don't escape. Most importantly, that they don't hurt each other. Which is fairly common, that people can make a weapon. Does that happen? Yes, yes, it really happens. Uh, One thing which is very common is the use of blades for hurting each other. Uh, What is called blade bazi. Hmm. That happens usually when the prisoners are being taken uh, in uh, jail vans from the prison to the courts and back, you know. So one inmate can hurt the other inmate by using a you know blade, hmm. which they keep between their fingers and they just slash 
the face or the neck of the man what are some ways in which prisoners typically smuggle in weapons or phones because i'm sure that even with such a vast prison like tihar right there must be obvious security leaks that no one can do anything about right i've seen this show called inside the world's De- uh, deadliest prisons i'm sure you've heard of yes, that as yes, well yes 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 and mai bada surprised tha you've got the norwegian jail jahan pe mental rehabilitation hai khud ki kitchen hai it's like ultra luxurious then you've got like ekdam bilkul you know like maximum security jails in siberia so like on that level what were some of the obvious um security hazards that prisons prisoners themselves like subjected themselves to like how how were they maybe smuggling in weapons or or phones like what are some things that you noticed or oh, there are any number of um, such activities that go on and what is interesting is that uh, the smuggling that happens in prison a happens in virtually every prison in the world for instance you mentioned smuggling of say phones it happens in every jail you know even the most secure jail there people ha- have a tendency to find out some way some leakage through which they can smuggle in you know a phone <clears throat> phones are very common commodities which uh, find their way inside the prison uh, and one of the very common techniques is the use of the prison staff themselves mm-hmm. right uh, and you know it's very little that uh, that can be done to prevent that uh, another very common thing which i used to initially feel is very peculiar to tihar is throwing things over the uh, wall of the prison hmm you know if you want to say throw a weapon a pistol inside the prison so you just wrap it up nicely in a packet and if you can throw it over the wall it will land on the other side the other person knows that it will land at so and so time and he manages to either pick it up himself or manages to have it picked up you know then other things is like uh, smuggling of drugs uh, very common and so on and so forth yeah like uh, several african mules from the african continent who often shove it up their rectums does that happen as well oh yes very often very very often the one of the very common modes of uh, smuggling is the use of what are called body cavities hmm and uh, so even in the mouth as well yeah yeah they will swallow it and uh, things like that koi particular aisi insightful stories that strike out because it was a long tenure that you served at tihar right that that you felt are like wow this is crazy i can't believe this happened no it was uh, fortunately not very long it was year and a half or so but it was long enough for me to experience almost every aspect of prison administration and aise pata lagta hai if you if you don't mind my frankness in this ki ab bagawat ki lehar aa rahi hai kahin na kahin kahin na kahin koi riot karne ki koshish karne wala hai nahi aisa nahi hota hai agar aap sabki dekhbhal theek tarah se kare sabki matlab hai staff ki bhi aur prison inmates ki bhi agar aap aise systems रखे अपने प्रिजन में जहाँ लोग अगर आप तक कोई शिकायत पहुँचाना चाहते हैं तो शिकायत उनकी सुनी जाए और उस पर कार्रवाई हो तो फिर सब चीज़ बहुत अंडर कंट्रोल रहता है लेकिन अगर उनको बिल्कुल दबा के रखा जाए उनको घुटन महसूस हो तब वो कुछ ना कुछ गड़बड़ जरूर करते हैं तो मेरा मेरी अपनी पॉलिसी ये थी कि उनको खुश रखा जाए जहाँ तक हो सके उनको कोई दिक्कत जस्ट गिव यू एन एग्जाम्पल फॉर इंस्टेंस फोन कॉल्स टू देयर रिलेटिव दे वर परमिटेड वंस अ वीक विच इज प्री लिबरल या सो मैनी ऑफ देम सेट दैट यू नो दिस टू लेस एंड यू नो वी शुड बी गिवन मोर अपॉर्चुनिटी सो वी इंक्रीज इट टू थ्री टाइम्स अ वीक विच इज वेरी लिबरल and mind you when you make a call they have to pay it's not as if it is free yeah so and it is for limited period of time the calls are recorded they are heard 
that uh, you know th those calls are not being misused no code language is being used and so on and so forth so this led to a lot of relief to the inmates another uh, thing that i introduced which i am very proud of and some day i'll write about it uh, <clears throat> was a scheme called sparsh now you see uh, we have a system of mulaqat as a visitor who wants to meet a prisoner can come and you know with prior approval of the court can come and meet uh, the prisoner now what would happen is that there were quite a few inmates who did not receive any visitor now those people who did not receive any visitors they were under a lot of mental stress because they felt that they have now been totally discarded by the near and dear ones shunned by society yeah. completely now why did those people not receive visitors because when they were arrested there was no way that the next of kin could be informed that they have been arrested say a migrant labor hmm. comes from say tamil nadu for instance he comes here and for some minor offense he gets arrested now his next of kin in tamil nadu they don't know that he has been you know taken to prison so they will never come to visit him this guy does not have the means to inform them also you know so what we did was we made a list of all such people who were not getting visitors and then we talked to each one of them that why is it that nobody comes to meet you now some people you know said that our family was not informed by the police or whoever had arrested us some other said <clears throat> that the family is so disgusted that they don't want to come and you know, meet me and so on and so forth so the scheme the scheme called sparsh was that we made an effort first of all to locate the next of kin of the inmates inform them and encourage them to come and see the inmate do you understand many people did not have the money to travel so from the prisoners welfare fund we gave money to those people to travel uh, to delhi we facilitated those meetings now those people who were depressed or you know under great stress uh because no one was visiting them when they met their next of kin uh you know after that they were far more at peace with themselves and with their surroundings similarly people uh, whose families were upset with them they were counseled that at least come and visit them uh, visit the man once they would come and visit. supposing even then you had nobody visitor we contacted ngos you know and uh, requested them to deputy somebody to go and meet the inmates as a friend yeah or as an acquaintance and they would meet go and meet them regularly as if they were friends now this small step taken by us led to a lot of stress being eased out of the minds of large number of prisoners yeah and so therefore the stress levels within the prison as a whole came down so we took many steps you know to keep people uh, you know prisoners uh, at peace with themselves and with the rest of the surroundings within the prison yeah i'm sure it can be a very isolating experience to be in a prison with several people but still feel like you know you don't yeah. have friends you can't trust others but I'm sure everyone when they see their next of kin irrespective of their you know personal vendetta or grudges it's still like a sense of hope um you know i also read that you started the prepaid taxi service at airports specifically ij airport uh i found that interesting because to this day i t make a choice whenever i come back say because the uber pickup lane is far away right you have to 
come out and uh, cross the several roads and then go down take a right you know what i mean right at the arrivals at t3 typically but then the delhi delhi traffic police uh, prepaid taxi is always right next to the arrivals right so more often than not both my dad and i have just taken that out of sheer boredom sure we'll pay like 300 400 rupees more but like we'll just get home quicker because no one wants to go and wait for the uber right so when i was reading that i was like that's very interesting that you decided to do that as well just uh, i just wanted to know the what the what the, the back story of that was well it was uh, on account of a large number of uh, complaints that we were getting uh, a it was very difficult to get cabs at uh, the airports two the cabs would uh, you know fleece the passengers three sometimes they would rob them four if supposing by mistake you leave something behind in the um, taxi say a handbag or a phone or some such thing then you will never get them now by this system we know who has taken which cab and who is the cabby and so on so this system was devised to meet all these requirements a as soon as you step out you there is a cab waiting for you you hop in uh, already the man knows that he has to go to so and so destination yeah he drives you the money has already been paid not to him the money has been paid to the booth and he will get the money eventually when he comes back and uh, so it was win win for everybody even the cabbies you know they would get their money uh, they were assured that they will get their money there was no disputes with the passengers and so on and so forth so it was it was uh, i should say the idea came to me because of large number of complaints Uh, that i would i was getting as dcp traffic and mind you this scheme was in 80s so now it has been there for almost 50 years <laughs> one one doesn't think about how long it's been but it's certainly something that i mean you were thinking about that in the 80s so i'm you know cuz i full disclaimer was born in 97 i didn't see the 80s at all <laughs> uh, but were cab robbery robbery is fairly common like like the idea of yes, delhi is- delhi being you know the crime capital whatever was that still prevalent yeah, right there i'll tell you um, the main reason is that international passengers especially the uh, our expat uh, labor class and people who work in the middle east or people who work in canada and so on when they come they are very new to the city they don't know the ways of the world mm, they so brought foreign currency yes foreign currency and um, so it is such people who are victims of uh, these robberies they will the cabbies will drive them and at a dark spot stop you know rob them or something and you know just throw him out of the cab and drive away mm. and uh, then they'll be very difficult for that person to report to the police and so on but with that slip that he gets from the prepaid taxi service he could go back and tell the police that well this is a cab i took and this is what happened to me and there was no way that the cabby could escape so all those malpractices stopped overnight overnight mm. so yeah. yeah people don't realize how um, because you know we're so used to it now it's a part of it people don't realize that actually someone thought of it and i'm so glad i'm sitting next to the person who thought mm-hmm. of that uh now i will ask you this you wrote in your book that one of the toughest times in your police career probably the toughest time ever was when the dirbaya case happened right yeah and when that happened uh you you literally said in the book that the chief minister wanted to resign people were begging for your blood and all hell was loose and you were just under pressure from all ends and it was an unprecedented crime that was reported it never happened before it certainly shook the nation and when i read that i was like that was you you were responsible <laughs> for taking care of it because one doesn't realize it right it's like it's something that happens on the news it's horrible but you don't realize that the person who's responsible for leading the criminals to justice is in the toughest situation ever you know almost as much as like the family of the victims or someone else 
what was that like when you first received the news and could you just run me through those days well to be very honest with you uh, when i heard news of the incident i knew it was a what in police parlance is called a bad case hmm. you know so i i realized it was a bad case but uh, truth be told i did not expect that there will be so much of repercussion uh, to that uh, incident but as things unfolded the following day a news reporter from ndtv called me and said don't you think you should resign so i said why should i resign we have already caught one of the you know perpetrators so no no it is such a heinous crime well heinous crime is not our fault you know there was nothing that we could have done to prevent it no 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 you should resign and things like that then i realized that this something very serious that is going on and uh, sure enough i discovered that the whole incident had been politicized uh, it was politics between the chief minister and the lieutenant governor it was uh, politics between a fledgling uh, political party uh, which was trying to make capital out of uh, the incident uh and trying to show its uh, you know prowess and so on and so forth and then certain people who were uh, opposed to me for some reasons uh, i had booked them when i was in the cbi so they were bank rolling all the agitations and all the uh, you know agitation all the demonstrations that were going on so it was a whole lot of thing that was happening and uh, in such incidents what happens is that people say you sack the dcp you sack the station house officer as a you, remedy as a remedy and you know for optics basically yeah. for optics uh so they asked me to sack my juniors my dcp and my joint cp and so on i said why should i sack them if i sack them if i suspend them or, or if i transfer them that means uh that i have no trust in them and i feel that they are at fault and if i do that who is going to investigate the case so you know people told me that you sacked so and so and so and so i said i will not sack anybody i will not even sack a constable and i will allow them to do their work and sure enough work was going on we caught one then we caught the second one and eventually we caught all of them and uh, they you know when the one turned out to be a juvenile who eventually after 3 years went scot free uh, another person hanged himself in tihar jail otherwise the remaining were all hanged so you know full justice was done to uh, nirbhaya who unfortunately you know died in the incident did you meet the the criminals did you meet them personally no no i was the commissioner i didn't need to meet them okay. there were so many people who to deal with them uh, i didn't meet them okay and when say when this happened you know just going back so you're trying to solve the case with your team right you've got all of these people who are now against you right like you said personal vendetta against you bank rolling agit- agitations and then you're in all of this and this is just uh, i want to use this moment to probably like highlight for others how to keep your head in a crisis like how did you do that did you have like like your family who was with you did you have did you have just a strong constitution for this kind of stuff actually when now when i look back i just felt that i had done no wrong my boys had done no wrong we were not at fault there was no way that the crime could have been prevented there was a judicial committee which uh, reviewed the, everything that we did to come to this conclusion whether we had done any wrong or not they said no uh, the police had done no wrong so that's why i was so cool you know if you want to grill me if you want to ask questions if you want to you know whatever you want I, i'll uh, give you replies to but uh, i i frankly 
I mean, it's hard to believe for others. And now I find it hard that uh, the way I, be, you know, behaved those days. But I just kept my cool. And of course, my family was very disturbed. My wife and my two girls, they were very, very upset. And they would see things on the, you know, TV channels, commissioner to be sacked commissioner to be sent home and this and that and they would get very upset but I was never perturbed you've seen so many cases you've served so many roles do you think the media is a detriment to investigations do you think it makes hard it, do you, it, it makes the job of a policeman harder yes it does I'll tell you how as soon as a crime is committed and the media comes to know of it, they will just rush to the spot. And they will trample the scene of crime. They will step on it? Yeah. And you can't stop them? No, no, no. Sometimes what happens is that, say there's a bomb explosion. Yeah. Now, the bomb explosion, the remnants of the explosion are spread over a wide area. You know? So when the police force arrives, they are very few in number. It's not easy to cordon off the entire area. Yeah. You will get clues of a bomb blast, you know, say 300 meters away. And the police in the public and the, first of all, the media, they will be. And then the worst thing is that they start parallel investigation. You know, that so-and-so said this, so-and-so said this, I saw this. And they start uh, making their own interpretations coming to their own conclusions, that is not this, it is not that, it is not uh, suicide, it was murder. Just to give you an instance, the Sushant Singh Rajput case, if you just look back, you know, media came up with all kinds of theories that he was murdered and this and that. and Well, to find out whether a hanging is homicidal or a suicidal is a highly technical job. It has to be done by a forensic scientist, you know, by forensic uh, medicine experts. Neither the police, nor the media, nor a member of public can come to a conclusion whether uh, the uh, hanging was homicidal or suicidal or what was it. It's only the medical legal evidence that uh, has to be analyzed uh, that can show you what it was. So, you know, the media begins to make all sorts of things about it. And then, um, you know, so-and-so was involved, his girlfriend was involved, um, pe you know, people went to jail, they were sent to jail just to assuage the feelings of the, uh, you know, uh, public. Why public? Why was public misled? Because of the media. Now, the media has to understand that police investigation is a highly scientific uh, activity. It is, it is not to be, you cannot rush to any conclusion uh, just based on one interview you do here and one. Um, somebody will say, Haan, ji, humne dekha tha. somebody came in yeah. like this and that. Oh, and they say, no, no, I have an eyewitness who saw so-and-so so coming. It's all useless. Let yeah, the police do their job. Let the forensic people do their job and come to a conclusion. And the police are answerable not to the media. They are answerable to the court of law. Nobody understands this. They are not even answerable to the government, mind you. The police are answerable to a court of law. You know? So, but, you know, the media doesn't understand this. And why, they, why do they behave like this? Because of TRP. They want to score brownie points, want to show that breaking news, you know, so-and-so mm. channel broke this news and declared that Sushant Singh Rajput's uh, hanging was homicidal. Mm. One, you know, channel just breaks this news and that is uh, the end of the matter. Does that alter the facts of the case that get in? Never. Facts can never be uh, altered. Facts will remain facts. No, but with so much pressure... Right? No. Is, with, is with the police pressure, forced to look at new information suddenly? With pressure, what the media does not understand, 
that it is doing is that it misleads or shall we say it uh, forces the police to do things which are unprofessional such as such as arresting somebody say mm. in the sushant singh case so many people got arrested unnecessarily because they were forced to do it yeah just to assuage the feelings of the people that's so weird it should not really be the job of the police to assuage the people right it should not be but sometimes you know there's so much of pressure and then your masters which means the political masters and this and that you know the elections in bihar for instance in this case the the stakes were so high that uh, you know this the elections could have gone this way or that way so there was pressure on the police that's so weird and if i would ask you this again because i've never sat across a policeman ever in my life and you know and retired rather and had this opportunity to do this i saw a stand up comedy video about like this uh, this comedian talking about how uh delhi police instills fear in him you know and that the first instinct of many when they see the police is that of fear and is that is there a place for feeling that fear uh can we feel baby hopeful and help looking at the police and i know there's all kinds of policemen across the country right so i don't want to dismiss anyone and say that that everyone is trying to strike fear in your hearts but is there logic to the police looking intimidating and striking fear in you know the public's hearts see the police should ideally strike fear in the minds of the criminals in the minds of the wrong doers you know who deviate from their straight and narrow path of uh, law it should not strike fear in the minds of a law abiding citizen law abiding citizen should be afraid of breaking the laws uh, if at all uh, on the road for instance if you are jumping the red light and if you are afraid that if you get caught the police will is going to prosecute you that uh, fear is legitimate that mm. is how it should be but if you are obeying all the rules why should you be afraid of the police you should not be the unfortunate part of it is that people still have fear of the police even when they are not in the wrong and why is it because a small section of the police conducts itself in such a manner that it gives the impression that you could be wrongly booked you could be wrongly harassed you could be unjustly you know uh, kept behind the cooler and so on and so forth so that is what should not happen the fact of the matter is the bulk of the police force you know are good good people but a few rotten eggs they spoil the entire show they mm-hmm. you know create this impression in the mind of the public that you should keep the police at a distance wow i've uh, i've always been on the other side of the document but i see that <laughs> there is merit to what you've said now taking a fresh new deviation your new book a cop in cricket is out now um or rather is going to be out soon depending on when we release this and so you officially retired from your position and joined the bcci as an advisor at the anti corruption and security unit which was later on added right so i have a series of questions around that um probably the first one is obviously virat kohli is special to everyone's hearts and you recount an incident in the book where he is crying right because his late father had to pay a selector to have him on the team right i'm not abhi hum ye baat nahi kar rahe ki bcci ka structure kya hai aur wahan kya in corruption rehti hai and i'm just diving straight into like a specific incident how common is that it is very common very very common and the fact that it could happen to virat kohli somebody so supremely talented you can imagine uh, what happens to people who are half as talented as he is mm. and struggling and when uh, a selector 
uh, tells that uh, cricketer, budding cricketer's parents that if you want your ward to be on the team, you have to pay this sum of money. Well, uh, how hard it can be on the parent and how hard it is on the child when the parent is not able to pay that money. So, it's very common. But how, just say, <clears throat> there are so many things to take from here. How common was this degree of corruption or general lack of structure or then an elitism that I put in the BCCI so I can do anything. Was it pervasive all across the organization? And you did also mention that in the first few years you struggled to even be heard or have proper resources. Not uh, the initial days or initial months, but throughout my uh, you know three years stint, I never got uh, any additional resources. I started with two men, and finished with two men, so I didn't get anything additional, nothing. And yet you were responsible for cracking some of the toughest corruption cases, private leagues, and you know all of these scandals. Yes, uh, it's by God's grace and also using common sense and my police uh, instincts and my police training. Yeah, but initially you said in the book that you did not want to be a part of the of the BCCI as an advisor. You wanted to be away from it. Uh, well, when the offer came to me, it came from such a man that uh, it was hard to say no. And I tried to make a few excuses. Those excuses didn't work. Uh, I was not doing anything else and I thought it will be a very good opportunity to, you know, be close to cricket and cricketers and also see what all goes on inside the cricket world and uh, what all I can contribute to fighting corruption in the game because uh, willy-nilly I had been associated with uh, all the major cases of corruption in cricket that had happened in the past in India. When you were not with the BCCI? Independently. Not at all. When I was still in the police. Hmm. For instance, the 2013 spot fixing case. For instance, the 2000 uh, CBI inquiry into allegations of uh, match fixing uh, against Indian cricketers. Uh, for example, uh, a certain Scotland Yard case uh, in which three Indians were the accused and the Scotland Yard came to India to investigate. Uh, for instance, uh, even the Hansi Cronier case, the filing of the charge sheet, it fell to my lot to do that and so on and so forth. Specifically the 2013 case, right, which was probably the first time when uh, the Rajasthan Royals match fixing case, that's the one, yeah, right? That's right. That's the one when dignified players like Sri Santh were exposed and caught in match fixing. If we are allowed to do so, can we go through some of the steps of how did you and your team figure out that match fixing is going on? I have written in the book that it was actually by sheer accident. A happy really? accident, yes. The accident was that uh, a central agency gave us a number and said that this number is uh, very suspicious. Probably some terror activities are being discussed on this number. So we took that number on um, surveillance. And uh, we also found out which are the num other numbers which are in contact with that number. All those numbers were taken under uh, surveillance. And we were overhearing the conversation that was going on. And we realized that there was some talk of cricket that was going on, which we found very odd because there were supposed to be terror activities, uh, you know, connected with the conversation. But here was a situation when cricket was being discussed. So we started to listen to them very carefully. And then we found out that uh, certain cricketers were being compromised uh, by various intermediaries. And... Uh, that uh, picked our interest and one thing led to the other and we found out that uh, three cricketers from Rajasthan Royals were uh, doing the bidding of uh, uh, you know fixers and bookies 
for a price and they were giving giving uh, they had promised to give certain signals to the bookies that they would be uh, giving wide balls or throwing no balls in certain overs or throwing away so many runs in a certain over after giving signals like you know tucking the towel in the front of the trousers uh it's or, that specific yeah that's so that is i'm talking about shishan's case yeah and he took the his towel uh from behind his trousers and tucked it in the front and before he started that particular over and all this we caught uh, both on audio as well as on video first on the audio that this is the signal i'll give you and then on the video when he was, he actually did that and gave away as many runs as he had promised so it was a very open and shut case uh, so that is how it happened and when when the security part of acu was added it became acsu right at that point you said that your additional charge was also to be in uh, you basically protected the players your pr- protection of players because you said that there was literally everyone coming in the locker rooms right there was no sense of privacy at all can you take me to an indian team locker room and what is the environment like like who is typically visiting players and what was the frequency like and what were you guarding them against specifically see the area in which uh, the players change and get ready for the matches is called pmoa in common parlance it is called the changing room or you can call it the green room or whatever but it is called the pmoa players and match officials area pmoa uh in that at present as per the existing practice only the players and their support staff support staff means for instance their masseur their physio uh, uh the video analyst and so on and so forth the coach hmm. assistant coach uh the security staff uh the anti corruption staff only these people are allowed and they are given accreditation cards so in case you are not carrying your accreditation you will not be allowed inside even if the player has left it behind hmm. in his hotel room he will not be allowed so he has to wait till the card arrives and then only he can be you know taken in so these measures had to be taken by the international cricket council uh, because earlier it used to be free for all players would go their families would go their friends would go uh, you know all kinds of the bookies will go the fixers will go and you know everything that was happening inside the change room was public knowledge so they would know that so and so is uh, playing on that particular day so and so has been dropped uh, etc etc so all that what is called uh, privileged information inside information that was public information now so it it was detrimental to cricket in more ways than one a the cricketers were very distracted imagine you are changing and there are ladies hanging around there yeah you know or children running around there uh imagine when you are discussing the strategy and there are people outsiders who are there so that is why uh, these rules were brought in and it they are found you know uh, followed very meticulously players are not even allowed to take their mobile phones inside and uh, it is the biggest sin that can that anyone can commit is to take a mobile phone into the pmoa and uh, so on so forth so it has brought about a lot of sanity i should say within the uh, changing rooms yeah and you describe in the book that most of your experiences with the players have been very memorable that you found them to be not the corporate personas that people put them out to be but to be mostly humble and extremely nice and respectable and that you even had lunches and dinners with the indian cricket team on so many occasions 
any particular incident that strikes out to you from that there are many you know for instance i have talked about in the book i have described uh, one evening which i spent it was a bonfire that the you know players had organized in dharamshala and they invited me to it they sat around a bonfire and and they joked they sang they narrated stories and just a kind of um, um, this fun camaraderie yeah fun and camaraderie and uh, uh, i was uh, you know the odd man out in the sense that i was so much so many years their senior they are much younger than both my girls but uh, they made me feel so welcome and you know so cool they you know they had fun with me they had a lot of uh, uh jokes and they were very fond of listening to my police stories yeah and they had many questions to ask and so on and so forth so it was great yeah and to take a complete deviation there's at least like six bookies and all kinds of uh, corrupt men who uh, make cricketers you know uh, drop balls or or get wickets but who is mk gupta oh mk gupta is the i should say the father figure or uh, as we say in common parlance the bap of uh, match fixing and spot fixing and almost any kind of corruption that you can imagine in cricket he was the guy who perfected the art of match fixing he he understood that if he could uh, tinker with the uh, progress of a match or with the proceedings of a cricket uh, match he could win tons and tons of money and uh, that is exactly what he did and in my book i have described the whole thing how he first spotted a delhi cricketer called ajay sharma how he groomed him ajay sharma did not have cricket shoes so he gave him money to buy shoes he made friends with him he got inside information from ajay sharma when he was eventually selected for the indian team and he traveled to new zealand with the team he would give information about the pitch about the weather about the composition of the teams the batting order and so on and so forth and with that information he could bet back home in uh, india uh place intelligent bets and he made tons of money and why did he confess of all people the crime to you because he was uh, cornered from all sides and he knew that he was going to be picked up by the team that was uh investigating him was he in hiding yes he was okay. on the run on the run so he had somehow heard of me so he approached me and he said i'll tell you everything and i'm prepared to give myself up but in return all i ask is that i should not be given the rough and ready treatment that the police is so notorious to give so i gave him that assurance mm-hmm. and i kept my word uh, he was never subject to uh, any torture or any harassment but a इन द सेम टाइम उसने पूरी प्ले बुक रिवील कर दी कि किस तरह से सट्टा लगाते हैं लोग कैसे करते हैं जो सी बी आई इंक्वायरी हुई वो उसके डिस्क्लोजर्स के ऊपर आधारित है और डिस्क्लोजर्स को सी बी आई ने कॉरोबोरेट किया टेक्निकल एविडेंस से और चीज़ों से क्रिकेटर्स के साथ बातचीत करके उनको कन्फ्रंट करा के तो सी बी आई इंक्वायरी असल में उसी का कन्फेशनल स्टेटमेंट है तो उसके बाद जो बुकीज आए उसके बाद जो बंदे आए लाइक वो इतने रेलिवेंट नहीं थे मतलब उसने ही गेव अवे दर गेम टू यू नो नो ही गेव अवे लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स एंड लॉट ऑफ पीपल बट दिस वॉज इन दर नाइन टू थाउजेंड राइट थर्टीन ईयर्स डाउन द लाइन इन टू थाउजेंड थर्टीन वी डू द स्पॉट फिक्सिंग केस and there the bookies and you know the whole new generation of bookies uh, had come up whole new generation of players had come in 
Uh, but the corruption was still lingering. I see. And these new bookies would come in. You also said in the book that they were more interested in spot fixing than match fixing. That's the new term that came out, right? You were you were better off controlling one player than trying to control the entire match. And in game, what is the brand they carry? How did they operate as opposed to the era of M K Gupta and the, all the bookies? No, just say. पुराने समय में ये था कि आपको अगर इंश्योर करना है कि एक टीम मैच हार जाए तो सिर्फ एक कैप्टन को पैसे देने से काम नहीं चलेगा सिर्फ एक कैप्टन को कॉम्प्रोमाइज़ करने से काम नहीं चलेगा कैप्टन को और कैप्टन के माध्यम से चार पांच और प्लेयर्स को आपको कॉम्प्रोमाइज़ करना पड़ेगा ताकि सब लोग बुरा खेलें ताकि मैच हार जाए अब वो बहुत डिफिकल्ट हो गया है क्योंकि अगर चार पांच प्लेयर्स को कैप्टन अप्रोच कर रहा है और किसी ने भी लीक कर दिया कि मेरे मुझे कैप्टन ये कर, आ, करने को कह रहा है तो पूरा गेम खत्म हो जाएगा तो इसलिए अब क्या है कि आप एक प्लेयर को पकड़िए कहिए कि आप ऐसा करो इस ओवर में इतने रन दे दो या इतने वाइड बॉल्स फेंक दो या इतने नो बॉल्स फेंक दो और आप सिर्फ उसी आ, एक इवेंट पर अपना पैसा लगाओ क्योंकि आजकल के टी ट्वेंटी गेम्स में हर बॉल पर सट्टा लगता है क्या बात कर रहे हो हाँ कि इस बॉल पर क्या कितने रन बनेंगे फोर लगेगा कि सिक्स लगेगा कि विकेट जाएगी कि क्या होगा हर चीज पर सट्टा लगता है तो अगर आपको ये पता है कि इस इस बॉल पर नो बॉल होने वाला है तो आप नो बॉल पर पैसा डालोगे एक एक बॉल का तो रेट ही कितना कम होता होगा मतलब आपको पता ही नहीं है एक एक बॉल पर करोड़ों का बेट लगता है एक बॉल पे बिल्कुल एक बॉल पर यूजुअली जैसे टिपिकली हम सुनते हैं कोई सट्टा लगाता है तो बोलता है कि मैंने इंडिया पे लगाया पता नहीं, 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 नहीं मैंने नहीं। पाकिस्तान पे लगाया ऐसे बोलते हैं हर हर बॉल पर पैसा लगता है इस बॉल में क्या होने जा रहा है <laughs> तो मैच में एक बॉल है एक बॉल एक बॉल पर पैसा लगता दो सौ बॉलों पर दोनों इनिंग्स हाँ दो सौ बॉल पर सट्टा लगता है क्योंकि जुआ खेलने वालों की कमी नहीं है जुआ खेलने वालों की इंजीनियरिटी की कमी नहीं है वो हर चीज कौन सा कैप्टन फील्ड में पहले जाएगा टॉस के समय उस पर भी पैसा लगता है कौन सा कैप्टन कैप पहनेगा कौन सा कैप्टन कैप नहीं पहनेगा उस पर भी सट्टा लगता है तो हर चीज में सट्टा लगता है वहां एक्चुअली प्लेयर खुश नहीं करेगा उसमें सट्टा लगा देंगे <laughs> कुछ कह नहीं सकते Who is designing these systems? Is this operating out of India only, or just they say that it's Dubai? It looks like it. No, ये देखिए आजकल पूरी दुनिया एक global village है. आपको ना India में रहने की जरूरत है ना Dubai में रहने की जरूरत है. आप कहीं भी रह सकते हैं. And you can communicate with whoever you want to in real time. तो आजकल तो ज़माना ही आप कहीं भी हो सकते हैं. You can even be on board a yacht or a board a ship. Yeah. and control the entire uh, booking thing that's insane now you also mentioned because most people in common parlance and the masses the only main t20 tournament they know about is the either the world cup trophy 2020 overs wali or ipl and ipl came around and changed everyone but then you said in the book there are several private t20 leagues in the country that exist yes right i was never privy to that और आपने भी बोला किताब के दौरान उनका पूरा काम है एक किसी से सट्टा लगाना है बस एंड दे गेट लाइक ऑल काइंड्स ऑफ प्लेयर्स हु नॉट मेक द नेशनल टीम हु हैव सम वट एवर इट इज राइट इज दैट रैकेट ऑफ टी ट्वेंटी लीग स्टिल एक्टिव प्राइवेट टी ट्वेंटी लीग्स एब्सोलूटली इजनिंग एवरी डे एंड एंड हु इज रिस्पॉन्स कर यू बिकॉज यू एन कवर्ड सो मेनी केसेज एनी पर्टिकुलर वन दैट स्ट्राइक आउट यू जहाँ पे आपने यू कॉट द गाय इज डूइंग दिस Yeah, I have uh, written about the Rajputana Premier League, which happened in Jaipur, and uh, everything in that uh, league was pre-scripted, uh, managed from outside, and uh, people were giving, being given instructions as the matches progressed, and surprisingly through the umpires, who received instructions on their walkie-talkies, hmm. you know. सो या राजपुताना वॉज वन उसके पहले रजवाड़ा प्रीमियर लीग हुआ था कोटा में और अभी भी हर रोज कोई ना कोई लीग कहीं ना कहीं चलता है और जहां उसका टेलीकास्ट या लाइव कास्टिंग शुरू हुई 
यूट्यूब पर या कहीं भी तो उस पर सट्टा लगना शुरू हो जाता है तो ज़्यादातर लीग्स जो है वो जुए के लिए ही खेले जा रहे हैं एंड दीज आर स्टिल ऑन गोइंग एंड यू कैन रली फाइंड दैम बिकॉज दर ऑपरेटिंग इन अन डिस्टेंट मैन और स्टिल यू कैन फाइंड दैम इफ देर इज अ विल एंड इफ देर इज इफ यूर बुक ही इफ यूर इंटरेस्टेड यू कैन फाइंड दैम बुक इज कम टू नो जहाँ कहीं भी ऐसा कोई मैच होगा तो बुक ही इसको तुरंत पता लगने में उनका अपना नेटवर्क है उनको तुरंत पता चल जाएगा स्पेसिफिक क्वेश्चन वट एग्जैक्टली पिच साइडिंग पिच साइडिंग इज फिनना बाई विच सम पीपल हु आर सीटेड इन द वेन्यू दे गेट टू सी इवेंट्स इन रियल टाइम दैट मीन्स दे बैठे हुए हैं देख रहे हैं कि मैच चल रहा है और उस मैच पर एक किसी बॉल पर छा फोर रन बाउंड्री मार दिया गया तो वो क्या करेंगे फोन पर कह देंगे फोर ये फोर जो है वो अपने किसी मास्टर को करेंगे और वो मास्टर उस बॉल पर बाउंड्री लगा है उस पर पैसा लगा देगा उसी वक्त उसी वक्त क्योंकि लैग है रियल टाइम में और हाँ, स्ट्रीमिंग में अब जो इंसिडेंट हो रहा है बाकी जो लोग 95 परसेंट नाइन्टी परसेंट पीपल हु आर बेटिंग आर सींग द इवेंट्स ऑन देयर टेलीविजन राइट टेलीविजन के के पर आप वो इंसिडेंट आठ सेकंड से लेके पंद्रह सेकंड के बीच बाद में देखते हैं मतलब अगर मैंने मुझे पता चल गया कि फोर हुआ है मैंने फोर पर पैसा लगा दिया आप टीवी पर देख रहे हैं आपको वो फोर नजर आएगा पंद्रह सेकंड के बाद तो आपने पहले से पैसा लगाया हुआ है उस पर because there are probabilities that it can be a single it can be two runs it can be there can be no run yeah. there can be a no ball there can be a wide ball there are so many probabilities on that ball so you will based on probability you will put money on that event but the other person knows about that event already so he knows that he is going to put so every time he wins so this information this man is sending all the time and that fellow is all the times uh, and it is not only that man who puts the money all people who are connected with him yeah. supposing he has 20 friends so all 20 people will put on the because so, there is a 15 second window yeah so the rest of the people who are watching on television they are the losers and these people who are part of that syndicate they are the winners wow and and ye yeah, is this still happening as there like a law around banning cell phones and there is no such law there is no law to even prevent match fixing and spot fixing leave alone pitch siding so whatever happened in the bcci where the more you sort of did your stint the more you realized there were undeniable corruption and like problems there like and you also said that the lodha committee came and gave some reforms but they didn't even consult you guys because what was happening at this time that got you ag- agitated no no there were so many things that agitated me you know firstly nobody was interested in fighting corruption hmm. they were not interested uh, whether we did anything or we did not do anything you know they there was there was no interest to uh, you know promote any preventive steps to fight corruption so we were just uh, there just for the sake of it whenever they would be asked uh, what have you done to fight corruption in cricket they would just say we have appointed mr neeraj kumar as our head of anti corruption and that was the end of the matter so it was just like ticking a box hmm. but basically they were not interested in even when we carried out very significant operations uh during my tenure informed them that we have done this and that It, it, they did not bat an eyelid over them and and so nothing happened so their indifference irked me no end but yet you still kept fighting on you still try to uncover bookies and and catch them whenever you could yeah i mean how could i overlook something which had come to my notice yeah you know i was doing my job with as much interest as possible because see we do our job a police officer does his job primarily 
primarily for self satisfaction that i developed this information and based on that information i managed to catch so and so i managed to prevent this crime or i managed to solve this crime and so on and so forth so it is largely for your own thrills and your own satisfaction and mm-hmm. that is what i kept doing the mohammad shami case where you said justice was shami is a funny one because it's just it's a little embarrassing the man was you know just meeting another woman and uh, the way it was carried on because i remember that he was in flag for a bunch of things right and then you actually helped him like help get to the bottom of things right i did not help him i just did the right thing and uh, the help was consequential uh, because if we had not done the inquiry in time he would have been kept out of the ipl his contract would have been kept in abeyance he would have lost a lot of money he would have you know uh, maybe lost a place in the team and so on and so forth mm. so whatever issues i had with the board i didn't want to kind of come those issues to come in the way of shami's career that's a very noble thing i don't think many people would want to do that because it's always like you know it's about me first um i want to ask you this because i don't know members of my family who have been in the police you know i'm sure you look at the world differently than a civilian i mean you are, you are i'm not saying you're in a perpetual looking out for danger looking at suspects all the time ki ye ho sakta hai gunegar nahi ho sakta maybe i've seen too many movies i don't know but um are there any particular psychological tells you seen in the interrogation room or when investigating that the average civilian might miss all the time such as all the time you know the way you know while uh, talking he say swallows his uh, saliva oh that's the, real yeah yeah it happens if you are trying to speak uh, a falsehood you know it shows on the man uh, so interrogation is an art and it is an art which you have to learn and develop as you go on in the police career so yeah that's how it is and kya ye baat sach hai jaise movies mein dikhate hain ek good cop hota hai ek bad cop hota hai is that actually like true like yes that... it is true and what is the, it is the idea ki ek se main thoda comfortable hu dusra thoda aise dara ke rahega tabhi how does it work on every criminal when you already seen it in films I'm not saying it works on every criminal but it is one of the standard techniques. Yeah. If you could because now my curiosity is rising what other techniques will the police typically use to get information out of a man? See these days there are so many scientific ways of doing things. You have the lie detector. Hmm. You know you have uh, even got uh, you know uh, so many tests the narco tests to get the truth out of uh, people hmm. uh, with prior orders of the court and so on so these days uh, getting the truth out of people is uh, not such a big deal and and do you miss your time as a younger policeman or did you prefer the roles that you had when you got older no see by god's grace i had a great uh, run in the police great innings and uh, i would just like to like to leave everything as they were and not relive the whole thing all over again yeah like i'm sure there must be some very uncomfortable moments as well in the career where you were supposed oh, to full of uh, plenty yeah. plenty and some amount of uh some the decisions are not sitting right with you but they must be done because justice takes precedence over something that you feel sure sure any particular cases i'm just trying to mind you for like if we can get like like a case that strikes out to you in your career in the several you know things you've done cuz i also read on your wikipedia i don't know how accurate that is that you were responsible for nabbing like a man close to daud ibrahim oh i have nabbed several of them who were close to daud ibrahim several so if you are referring to manish lala yes he was very very close so was uh, subhash thakur bhai thakur um the fellow called um, farooq you know shabir so many of them 
were who virtually grew up with Dawood. So quite a few of them. And when you were nabbing these men, were you in your Maruti jeep chasing them? Did you no, no. ambush them? You see, if you read my other two books, yeah. which is Dial D for Dawn, which is primarily on the Bombay underworld, uh, and also Khaki files, then those stories are there. How each one of those cases were, yeah, uh, yeah was solved, and it is not a standard procedure that you follow and you catch a criminal. Every uh, operation leading to the arrest of a gangster. is a story by itself yeah before we kind of end things one last question because there's been enough shows on how crime looks like in delhi versus how it looks like in mumbai so in both places are there any particular advantages to being a cop in mumbai say to being a cop in delhi uh I think more or less everything is uh, is the same in the sense that the same political, uh, you know, pressures and so on. Actually, to be a cop in Delhi is uh, better. Why? Because we are not under the local politicians. Hmm. By local politicians, I mean politicians who run the Delhi government. Hmm. Right? We are not answerable to MLAs. and chief minister and deputy chief minister and so on and so forth home minister we are answerable to the union home ministry that the union home ministry is busy looking after the entire country hmm. and they don't have time to you know micromanage delhi police so virtually there is no interference from any political politicians neither the state politicians nor the central politicians so you are virtually on your own and once in a while if there is a uh, you know interference if you stand your ground you will sail through you know because they will see they don't have local interests hmm. the people in the they have national center, interests yeah they don't have local interests whereas a local politician has local interest hmm. you know so the delhi police to that extent is a blessed police so it is easier to be a police officer in delhi than to be in bombay mm. and parting notes about police reforms if at all yeah police reforms is a very complex uh, subject and uh, you know a lot can be done and lot should be done and it is a continuous process but uh, i feel that the bulk of the reforms can be done by the police itself hmm. without it, external interference yes it knows what needs to be changed what needs to be done but uh, it refuses to change it refuses to reform itself when a certain officer who has that kind of uh, understanding and the will uh, comes along he manages to enforce those reforms but once he's gone everything is forgotten and things are back to square one well neeraj ji it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today thank you for taking the time out and coming all the way here and being very honest about everything that has happened in your career and uh, accommodating me in both english and hindi uh, and also for the excellent book that you've written a cop and cricket that people can buy on amazon juggernaut uh, and do you have any public profiles that you Are you on Twitter, Instagram, somewhere else? Yes, I am on Facebook. I am on Instagram. I am on Twitter as well. Although I don't have many followers. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I am on all these platforms. It's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Likewise, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was pleasure was mine too. Awesome.